one of the things we're talking about again is is the dust storms and uh, what effect that can have in your air conditioner. So there's there's and we're getting into that time of year. And with the air conditioning, we've talked about it in the past. It's often a two step process, and there's multiple things that can can cause symptoms on an air conditioner. And the most common thing that we have is my car is cool but not cold. And that's a classic symptom of a car that or a system that's low on charge. But you can't just go add a little bit of refrigerant. There's a process that you have to go through of, of evacuating the system, and, that, and that's recovering all the refrigerant, weighing that refrigerant through the machine, and we're weighing that in kilograms or ounces, and then getting the proper charge back into a system. You can't just go like we used to be able to do in the, in the you know, 60s, 70s, 80s with, with R12 refrigerant and just go add a little bit of refrigerant. You might get close. But these cars are, are within an ounce you can have problems. So there's, there's a process that we have to follow. Yeah, the cars in the past would uh, maybe have two pounds or three pounds of refrigerant, where now they may have 16 ounces, and one or two ounces is going to affect the efficiency of the system. And when the system isn't working properly, it can lead to premature failure. So it's real pr- real. Real, you need to make sure that system is properly charged. Well, and not only just premature failure, Tim, but but lack of performance. You can get an overcharge of oil, and that's going to take away from the heat exchange co- abilities w- within the condenser or the evaporator. Uh, you can you can have uh, it'll just make it inefficient. An overcharge can be worse than just even an undercharge. And even an undercharge system, on a day like today, it was nice and cool this morning. That will blow fantastic but not in the afternoon. But besides a full charge, we have to have a a, a fan that's working properly. We have to have mode doors, which are directing the air. Maybe it's uh, there's a heat mode door to help you blend. That would be a blend door to help you get the temperature that you want. Maybe you don't want it blowing out 60 degrees. You want it 70 or or 72. So that's got to be working properly. And then we want to be directing air into the car that's either recirculated or fresh air, depending on the amount of occupants. For example, if you've got a car full of people, you're going to start having humid bad breath probably filling up that car. So you want to have that on fresh air. Also, when you're getting in the car to get going and and it's been heat soaked all day and the thing is hot, you don't want to be recirculating that hot air inside the car. You want to get the windows down, get that air flushed out, and get fresh air in the car and start cooling that air. And then maybe go over to recirculate. If you're by yourself, it's just like cooling your house. You're not sucking air from outside in all the time to cool the, you know, the, the thing's just working overtime. But in a car, it's a little bit different. You need to do that to keep the air fresh inside. Uh, and then this, the another important thing is the cabin air filter. We see those things coming in all the time. And, and for car people that don't know what a cabin air filter is, that's just the filter, just similar to your house that everybody's supposed to be changing once a month, and probably we don't, <laughs> most of us. I know I always forget about six or seven weeks when I start hearing the thing whistling to suck air. So it's something in your car that you need to change depending on your driving habits or conditions, i.e. dust storm. Typically, we recommend that, what, once a year? Yeah, once a year, 12,000 miles. Um, but, you know, sometimes with the dust storms, we get them to dirtier quicker. Well, yeah, and that's that's uh, one of the things you can do on the dust with the dust storm. First off, if you get caught driving in a dust storm, as far we'll cover the safety stuff later, and we'll post that on our Facebook page as well. But try to limit your driving because that that engine is just a vacuum cleaner sucking in air. It's just sucking in air constantly, and that can plug up or restrict an engine air filter. It's not going to do it once in a storm, although it might if you're stuck in one for a long time. But the other one is the cabin air filter. If you can get that switched over to be bringing in the interior air or in recirculate, you're going to be filtering the interior air and not drawing air in from the outside. That would that would be one thing you want to do in a dust storm to help you prevent from getting a plugged up filter. So another thing with the cabin air filters for people with allergies, you need to get those changed regular basis, typically once a year. But you can ask your shop too, do you have a carbon impregnated filter? That helps get rid of perfume odors, uh, allergens, pollens, whatever. They're, you know, it's referred to as a cabin air filter, but we also call it a, a, a pollen filter or a micro particulate filter. If you want to want to uh, dress up the terminology a little bit, or if you um, frequently have animals in your car, dogs and cats, that that, that 
that can get clogged up in the air filter too. Well, you know what though? Even if you don't have dogs and cats, we saw one the other day at the shop. It looked like somebody somebody got a hold of Grandma's knitting kit, and I think it was a pack rat or uh, some other type of creature because they had a beautiful nest in there. But what's what's funny is the customers and the people with the car. You know, they bought this car new. They, it, it, the AC seems to be pretty good, but it's really not enough to complain about. And then when we bring that up and say, oh, my gosh, look, we took a picture. Look what we found in your car. Oh, I never noticed that. And then we put the cat, put a new cabin air filter in. And, uh, you know, you ever seen that Memrex commercial? Is it live or Memrex? That's what the AC feels like. They call us back and they're going, oh, my gosh, I'm getting blasted out of my car. So yeah. just some good maintenance. Again, it's not something you have to run out and do. Just ask about it next time you're in the shop. And one of the things, uh, before we take some calls, that uh, is a little bit of a thorn in my side and, and is uh, batteries on the roadside or uh, you know batteries from your motor service club, whether it be your insurance company or whoever ha- you have your road ser- service with. We want to prevent you, first of all, from having to have a jump start or a battery problem. Inevitably, sometime in your life, you're going to have to have a jump start and you're going to need to buy a new battery. But the whole idea is is to be proactive and preventative with your car. So we hope that your shop is doing a battery test on your car every time it's in. We don't want you to have to buy a battery and make a decision on the side of the road. I don't think those are a good idea. There's a whole lot of reasons for it. Proper tools. The guys oftentimes don't have proper tools or experience for that matter. They have a limited inventory of batteries. Tim, how many batteries do we have at the shop? I'm not talking about how many batteries do we have as far as um, of one part number, like we have 200 oil filters because we have multiples of one part number. We have very wide coverage but very narrow. We, we want to have one of everything. So how many yeah, we, batteries we, we, is we have that? A, yeah, it's a deep and broad coverage. We have, probably have over 50 part numbers that probably covers about 95% of the, the makes and models out there. So they're fit for the car. It's not a make to fit battery well and 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 we use delco batteries we also have some motorcraft batteries and we also bosch we also have bosch batteries because we we need to have coverage but we're still ordering with 50 different part numbers we still daily order a battery well i wouldn't say daily but weekly or ordering batteries to fit the car now you can go with some other battery brands or some private label stuff or or companies and they have what we call a condensed part line so instead of having a a 24 series battery that has the negative and positive on the side closest to you you might have then you have a 24 f that has the negative and positive on the side furthest from you well you get the universal brand like they have on the battery truck that shows up when you really just want to jump start and where are the battery terminals charles on the opposite side they're supposed to be. <laughs> well, or in the middle. So they're, they're going to split the baby. Instead of having to have two batteries on the truck, they're going to put them in the middle. So now you're stretching cables, and, and, and it's just not a good idea. Secondly, there's some cleanup issues. What are you going to do with all this acid? Do you want it in your driveway? I don't think so. No, I don't. <laughs> <laughs> and, then, and then, Charles, you're, you're the technician of the group. I mean, we're all te- – well, except for Tim. Tim is a baking technician with his cookies. But uh, Robert and, and Charles – Charles is a master tech as well as I, and Robert's got a few ASC certifications. Charles, what are some of the things – I mean, you can't – plug in a battery. You just can't plug in a battery, can you? No, you can't do that anymore. you got to register the replacement. you got to tell it how many amp hours it is. got to tell it what type of battery it is, what date you changed it. You know, everything's dependent now. The car charges at different rates depending on how old the battery is for deterioration. Everything matters. Well, and when we say register a battery, the one char- example Charles is using with some of your BMW for sure, some of your Mercedes and Minis, we're not talking about registering a warranty card and mailing that in. The car's computer system is so sophisticated, you have to know, the car needs to know how many, like Charles said, how many amp hours are in the battery. Uh, what type of battery? Is it a, a lead acid? Is it an absorbed glass mat or an AGM? The computer needs to know this stuff so it can properly operate the car. And we can talk about that more, but we're going to get some phones. We've got some very patient people holding. And first, we're going to go with PJ in Scottsdale. He has got a 2003 E150 Ford van. PJ, what can we help you with? Yes, sir. I have a E150, and uh, the vehicle has an emission. It can't pass emissions. Because there's a special, uh, the service engine lights on, and if I took it in, and there's a, a kit that um, goes on to, to service the vehicle, 
and I was just trying to figure out if I should sell my vehicle or go ahead and try to service it and pass admissions. PJ, when you say you took it in, did somebody look at your van and pull a trouble code or a diagnostic fault code out of the computer? Do you know why? Right. Okay, and what's that code? Do you know? Uh, they did not exactly give me the precise code. I just know that Ford had a service memo out that it required a special kit because of plastic or, or when they first made the vehicle, there's a, a, a feature on it that changed, that disintegrates after a certain period of time, okay. and they made a kit for it, and that kit is somewhat very pricey. Okay I, th I th okay, I thought you said chip at first, as in computer chip, but I think you're talking about a kit. And I suspect that you may have a fault code around a vacuum leak or a lean fuel condition possibly, or even an engine misfire. And so what needs to happen there, someone needs to go in, and it sounds like they've done that, is they've retrieved the trouble code, find out what the fault is, go ahead and diagnose that. And I am pretty sure on your Ford van that there's a new revised intake manifold is probably what you're talking about. The manufacturers are, are producing these cars with a lot of plastics and composite parts because they need to save weight. It's helping with fuel economy. But what happens after 10 years or so, chemicals passing through there, the combustion process, the crankcase ventilation, these plastics start to warp and break. Or they have, or Ford discovers, or Nissan, or whoever it may be, discovers there's a better mousetrap now. So they do a redesign. So, no, you don't need to sell the car. That's my, my first thing. There's no reason to sell the car. Don't, don't fix, you know, a, what might be a six or $700 problem with, with a $15,000 van. You need to go find a shop, and, it, and if that shop, you're comfortable there, stay there and let them fix your car for you. Up first this segment, we've got Owen from Mesa with a 2001 Chevy. Owen, what can we help you with? Well, it's kind of unusual. You tell me if it's something uh, that you don't want to uh, uh, try to uh, handle or not. I've been offered, as part of an estate settlement, I've been offered a 2001 Chevy I call them wagons. They have uh, two bit seats in the rear, and and they seat eight. It has a hatchback on the rear end. I don't know exactly what that is called specifically. The body, the body type, or whatever. Sure. But it's a six cylinder. It's 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 reportedly oh to got about ninety thousand on it or something like that. I was back there Christmas and I saw the vehicle and the vehicle visually is, is very clean inside and outside. But I'm wondering if this, if a vehicle that age, it does have some inherent major weaknesses that may, that may, uh, crop up now. Or, or would you know of any or not? No, I mean, I, I'm not sure what exactly model you're talking about. Maybe an Equinox or some type of SUV. But, you know, and that doesn't have. I thought you were going to say you found a car with like twelve or thirteen thousand miles on it. Some, you know, what we'd call a Sun City uh, estate car, but that that's that is low mileage for the year for sure. It's less than ten thousand miles a year. But no matter what kind of car you're looking at buying, no matter how good the deal is, it's always worth spending fifty or a hundred dollars. Take that car into a shop and have it looked at and find out. Find out what's going on with the car. Is it has it been wrecked? Has it been properly maintained? And you know, some of those cars that that sit in the garage all the time, or maybe they sit in the garage here in Arizona six months out of the year or seven months out of the year, those aren't always the sweetheart deal you think they might be. There's things, Charles. I mean, cooling system work. What do we see with with the coolant that hasn't been flushed, for example? Start seeping up, eating parts. Do yeah, I mean, the they corrode. The, corrode yeah. cor the corrosion from the coolant, that coolant will actually turn to acid, and it will start eating away at aluminum parts. You get leaks there. Um, you can have fuel that, that um, turns to varnish, all kinds of different problems. So it's not something to shy away from, but always get the car inspected before you buy it is my advice. So, Owen, thanks for the call. Next, we're going to take Kevin from Phoenix, if I do this right, on a 2006 GMC Sierra. What can we help you with, Kevin? Well, this is a follow-up call, Matt. Uh, last week, you know, I changed out my right front a wheel hub bearing. You know, that was bad on a four-wheel drive. Yeah, you had a <laughs> ABS light or something coming on, exactly, right? Exactly, exactly, yeah. Um, well, the good news is, yeah, the bearing was bad. I did it myself last night, you know, and uh, uh, replaced the sensor, of course, with the 
the better bearing, you know, it comes with a new sensor. Um, anyway, uh, started up, drive around, light comes on. Light went out, was out initially, okay? So I thought, all right, success. Uh, light's coming back on again. Goes out, comes back on again. Now, my friend that helped me had a, a reader code, you know, whatever you call those things. Sure, code reader. Uh -huh. and, yeah, and um, it, it didn't show a, a code fault, okay? Even though the light was on, it didn't show a fault code. That's what I'm trying to say. Right. Uh, now, um, will this ABS light go out over time? Uh, is my question, I guess, you know, will it disappear magically or whatever, you know? Well, uh, I would say if it does disappear magically, the sarcastic side of me says it'll eventually burn out. <laughs> but that, that's not going to solve the problem. And, and no, it's not going to go out. It's not going to fix itself. You've had enough key cycles in the car where if the code was, was gone or the fault code was gone, the light would be off. And what people don't understand is, you know, they think, gosh, why do they charge so much to do run diagnostic testing on a car? Well, that little code reader that your buddy has is probably cost $100. And that's, that's a, if you want to put it in the medical world, that's a stethoscope for the doctor. The, the code readers and the diagnostic scan tools that we have will get into every system on the car. They're fifteen thousand dollars. That's the the MRI or the the uh, CAT scan machine or the EKG, and so you and, and you can't just read the code. You've got to know you you've got to know how to interpret all those squiggly lines and what all that data means. So, getting the code is just the beginning of solving the problem. So it's you're probably at the point now. You need to go get the car fixed. It's a it's a two thousand six. It's a newer vehicle. Don't let the thing get away from you. Just make the investment and go have somebody properly diagnose it and get it fixed. That That's the best thing for you. Um, you know, the wheel bearing was bad based on the description that we had in the conversation we talked about the way you described it after the show last week. And uh, you had a pretty good chance that needed to be fixed anyway. It was bad. But just don't let it get away from you. The other important thing to know is the ABS is not going to work on the car. And that's okay. It's now just like a 1986 truck instead of a 2006. It doesn't have ABS. That's not going to affect your normal braking. But just don't let it go. Keep the car in nice shape and, and, and find a shop to get it fixed. So we appreciate the call, and I appreciate the follow-up. And I would like another follow-up when you finally get it fixed so we know want to know really what it is. I have some hunches, but I'll wait to hear back from you. So thanks again. And Holly, you're up next. Always got a Greetings. Cheap. How are you doing? How are you? I'm doing great. How are you? Wonderful. I uh, am traveling from 29 Palms Marine Base to the Phoenix area, and I'm traveling, and I, I heard your show, and it's a perfect time for me. Are you a Marine? Um, I have a 2012 Honda Fit. Um, I had my first oil change at 10,000 miles. I'm now at 30%, and I'm also 16,000 miles. And I have a light that's come on. It looks It's a little wrench. I'm assuming it's my oil light. Um is telling me it needs an oil change. My question is, how imperative imperative is it to get this oil change immediately, or do I have time to even run around this weekend and go back home on Monday or what? Well, it, it's not imperative, but we can talk about this too. There, there's a lot of things that, um, a lot of marketing behind selling cars, and oftentimes the marketing department and the engineering department are two totally different things. <laughs> Oops. And and so what that light means when that wrench comes on, I think, Charles, don't the Hondas, sometimes it's a wrench with an A or a B or a C? Yeah, when the wrench comes on a little bit later on the odometer section of it, you'll actually see service due. It'll say A1 or B1. It'll come on at a certain percentage. It's yeah. just getting there. And, and what that is, the computer has a map or a program built into it that recognizes – how often you drive the car, what, how much throttle input you have, how fast you drive, all kinds of different parameters. And they will turn that light on or, or run the percentage down based on those conditions. They'll also use the mileage. So I don't like the fact that the car will allow you to go 10,000 miles on an oil change. I think it's crazy. I would probably go 5,000 or 7,500, ignore the light, don't reset it in between and just stick on your on your on your service guidelines and then have your shop that's also what we call in BMW world it's condition based services the computer is going to tell you what they want you to do but we also need to inspect it sometimes those are a little overzealous i think 
They, they want you to do a lot more than what we feel that you need. And sometimes they're way off base, especially on oil services. Yeah, exactly. Transmission services. There's a number of different things. But if you also look in your owner's manual, you'll see a chart there. And it will tell you what that wrench means. And then if there's an A next to it, it's going to have a prescribed set of, of parameters. You're coming up. Your first service now, your second service with around thirteen or 15,000 miles, that's what I call glorified oil change. A lot of the dealerships will have this big grand list of all this stuff, but it's really, for the most part, stuff that's part of a part of a normal service, part of a, a, a good oil service. And then you're probably going to be looking at an engine air filter and a cabin air filter. It's, it's, you're, you're right in the time frame. And, uh, and that's probably about it. Tires. Tire, well, rotation. tire rotation. Tire rotation. Maybe we're starting to see on some late model cars now, especially the ones with direct fuel injection, we're starting to see that the manufacturers want you to add a fuel system cleaner, an engine decarbon. So you need to be doing that. When, and you should be using a top tier fuel, a good fuel, that uh, good name brand that's got the good detergents and additives in it. Doing that will help you keep the car running and that Honda will go and go and go forever. So thanks for the call. And that's a good one. And, uh, we're going to take Joel from Tempe. Joel has a 2007 Kia. And speaking of Kia, that is one of the cars that now in the owner's manual tells you, you must use a fuel system cleaner every 7,500 miles. Joel, what can we help you with? Well, that might be my problem guys. Um, I have a 2007, 145,000 miles. Within the last month, if driving more than uh, 30 miles, all of a sudden it feels like a cylinder goes down or like it's only running on four of the six cylinders. Is that the fuel system then? Well, do you have a, a light on the dash that says service engine soon or check engine? No. 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 N- neither one of those are on. And, and it, the car runs great at 35 miles an hour on the streets but then you get out on the freeway you get it over 75 and if you've gone driven more than 25 miles it literally feels like the cil- what two of the cylinders shut down does, so when you say that does it have a misfire where it starts to shake or is it just generally reduced say by 20 percent power reduction or or a shake like a misfire both okay well, it, it, at first I thought it was a flat tire. It was that bad. So I pulled over and looked, and no, and I set the car for a little bit, took off, nothing happened. But if you've driven 30 miles, then it comes back in. Well, I would be some, one thing I would want you to do is turn the key on the car before you start it and just make sure that the check engine light even works in the first place. The car will do what's called a bulb check and, and illuminate all the dash lights when you first initialize the key. Let's make sure that light is working because that 2007 Kia is sophisticated enough to where it's going to turn on the check engine light if there's a fault code or if there's a failure most of the time. Now, Charles, I mean, if you had that car, there's a lot more that we need to know. But what are you going to start looking at? Absent a fault code, you're going to first test drive it. Now what? Yeah, absent a fault code, test drive it, get it hot, see if it actually starts doing it. If you can start, if you can actually feel it, you know something's obviously going on. So first thing is you're going to start checking your plugs, your wires, you know, if you can feel it. But in that case, you're going to have a fault code. So definitely make sure your light works itself. Secondly, get a code checked. Even if it's if it's not working, go get a code checked so you get a, a guideline of where in an area. But Well, we can do what's called uh, mode 6 diagnosis. The computer, we can go in and look at the background. And, and before the check engine light comes on, there's a pending code. The computer will see that there's a pending failure. The computer recognizing, recognizes that something's wrong, but it just hasn't met the criteria yet to turn on the light. And then you can get, you know, maybe a mass airflow sensor, a, a restricted or plugged up catalytic converter may or may not set a fault code because it still may be efficient. So not, it, it's something that we need to get into a shop, get the problem to duplicate, get a technician that knows what they're doing to test drive the car. And, and it's something that can be fixed. Just because there's not a check engine light on does not mean that, that a shop cannot fix that. We're going to go with Curtis in Mesa on a 2008 Dodge Nitro. Curtis, I'll push this right button here in a second, and we'll get you in. What can we help you with, Curtis? 
All right. Today, when I was driving home from my son's football game, I was uh, cruising down the street, and then when I went to pass somebody, all of a sudden my transmission all I lost all power. Um, I went to an auto parts store to like scan the codes, and I came up with a code of P zero seven three three and seven thirty, some kind of transmission fault. Did you get a description as to what those codes actually meant? Um, let's see, the seven thirty was something incorrect gear ratio. Okay. And the 33 was ratio error in third gear. Okay. So what's happening there? I think that Nitro might have a CVT transmission, and even if it does or doesn't, it's probably the same the same issue. The computer system, or in your car, might have a transmission control module. It's going to monitor the input speed of the transmission from the engine, and then it's going to monitor the out, output speed of the of the transmission shaft. And it's going to compare those two. And when you see a slip ratio code, something in the middle is not between those two sensors is not connecting anymore. So there, there's probably an internal failure in there. You know, I love that to make up statistics. I think you know half the stats are made up uh, right before they're they're given. But the good majority of the time. You have a, a fault in a transmission. It's an electrical issue, very, you know, very likely. But you could just as well have a mechanical failure in that transmission. So you're going to want, probably in that case, I would take that to a transmission shop like Tri City Transmission, right by the uh, Tempe Marketplace, uh, McClintock, and uh, well, the Rio Salado and Smith is their location, right by the across the street from the Danny's Family Car Wash. But that's something that is probably best served at a transmission shop. If you have a good shop that you're comfortable with and you and you like and you have good experiences there, that would probably also be a just as well going there and starting with them. And if it's something they can handle, great. But if you've got something going on with the transmission, and uh, just good luck and let us know what, what follows up with it. But another thing, no additives. Don't go add brake fluid. You know, drop a brake fluid. Don't go get the... Uh, the magic snake oil sauce off the shelf at the local auto parts store. Those things can cause more damage by fixing a problem or attempting to fix a problem that you don't have that's not related to that. So just please follow us, uh, follow up with me and let us know what happened. And, it, and you can do that by email by going to bumper to bumper com as well. Thanks for the call. And we're going to take Mike and Casa Grand on a 2001 Chevy Malibu. Mike, what can we help you with today? Uh, yeah, gentlemen, um, I'm having an issue with the. Well, it's um, the button for the hazard lights on, on the car. Um, it clicks intermittently. Um, it doesn't do it all the time. It does it sometimes, but it also affects the blinker. Sometimes the blinkers won't work, and if I tap the button, the blinkers will start working. Is, um, and I have no idea what, what's going on with it. Can you help? Is that a, a triangle up on the dashboard? Yes, it is. Okay. Charles? Yeah, your, your turn signal signals are actually going to walk actually going to pass through your hazard switch. So when mm -hmm. your hazard switch itself acts up, your turn signals won't work because the circuit actually goes through that to complete the circuit. And, and aren't, Chucky, aren't some of those, isn't the flasher, I know in the Volkswagens and Audis, the flasher unit used to change the flasher under the dash. The flasher unit it's is built actually, into that. it's actually the switch on, on that car, more than likely, Mike. Okay. So... It drives me nuts. I gotta turn up my music just so I don't hear the dead gum thing click. <laughs> well, I, I would bet it's probably if you're pretty mechanically inclined, uh -huh. you could probably go to a, a Napa or the deal. You know, the, a, an aftermarket situation might have it. Uh, the dealer would have that for sure. But it's probably you know if it's not too expensive a part and you're mechanically inclined enough, I would probably just plug one in. Or or you go to the auto parts store if they have 25 of those things in stock and they yeah. sell one a week. It's a good start. <laughs> Odds are pretty good. <laughs> Check your bulbs. Make sure all the bulbs and everything are working. But otherwise, I think a flasher assembly would be a pretty safe bet on that one. And that's what I was, I was thinking about maybe replacing the relay um, itself, which is kind of on the side of the dash uh, behind the driver's side door. Um, but, yeah, then maybe that's what I need to do. Maybe just replace the whole assembly. I, I, I like to go to Vegas once in a while, and I would put it on – I'd put my bet on the uh, – on the flasher hazard switch because I believe it's one assembly. That that's what I would do. Uh, we would start with doing t actual testing, but uh, you know that that you can certainly take a guess. It's worth it probably on that one. And we're going to squeeze in Tim here on it from Gilbert with a synthetic oil question. Tim, what can we do for you? Yeah, just to follow up when you were talking about oil change intervals, um, I'm kind of under the impression that if you're using a full synthetic with a premium filter, that you could go. 
say ten or twelve thousand miles between oil changes. Would you agree with that? Or, um, well, that's a big debate, and and, I, and the answer is yes, and the answer is no. What kind of car are you driving? I've got uh, ninety six uh, Tahoe, and I've got a ninety one S ten pickup. Okay. I traditionally have always said that if you want to use synthetic oil, do it for extra protection, not to stretch out your oil changes. And I agree that probably if you have a good filter and a properly running car, that the oil is still good after seven, eight, nine, maybe 10, maybe 12,000 miles. But it may not be. And we're starting to see, like BMW, for example, the car will go 15,000 miles on an oil change. But what we see on the cars that have been at the BMW dealership and they start coming to us or they start coming to us from the Audi dealership after they're out of that free maintenance time, all the plastics in, in the PCV system are, are corroded and contaminated. And that's because that oil is carrying that junk around. So you probably can if you're really proactive and you take care of your car. But it's also having the trained set of eyes looking at your car all the time? That's a good question. We appreciate it.